webinar is about improving maintenance and purchasing by better integrating vessel data. And we're looking at the subject today from a seafarer and a superintendent's perspective. So that means how can we put data together in a way which better helps to manage maintenance and purchasing? And to help us better understand how to take human factors into account, we're very pleased to have Sam Megwa, who's the former programs director with the oil company's International Marine Forum, OKIMF, to share some introductory thoughts with us. So at OKIMF, Sam led the Human Factors Program, among other projects, and he's also the former head of strategy, risk compliance and environmental management with BP Shipping. So maintenance management isn't ultimately about data on a screen, it's about keeping ships in safe working order and people knowing what they need to do to keep it that way without information overload. And maintenance management is getting much more complex today. We've got increasing amounts of new equipment on board, such as scrubbers and ballast water systems. And the equipment is getting more complex and harder for non-specialists to maintain. So digital technology has a big role to play in getting there. First, we're going to hear from Sam. He's going to do a short interview with me. So I'm going to ask him to give an overview of what human factors means in the shipping industry and perhaps how digital tools should fit with that, including with maintenance and purchasing. Sam can't stay for the whole webinar, but he'll be able to answer questions through typing for a few minutes um, during the, uh, the section after him if you want to write him any questions in the Q&A box. Then we're going to go to Pune in India to hear from Joy Basu, CEO of Smart Ship Hub. They're sponsoring the webinar today. They're a maritime software company that specialize in helping seafarers and shore staff get better insights from shipboard data. So they're tackling the big challenge of getting data off ships easily without a big work burden for the crew. So you need a, both a way to connect to the different sensors and manual reporting systems and standards, communicate it, and then use the data to get a better understanding of how the ship equipment is operating and how it needs to be replaced and where maintenance should be done. So we'll go to the first part of the webinar. So I'd like to ask Sam, first of all, would you like to give a quick explanation of the human factors movement in shipping and uh, what, what it means? Thank you very much, Carl. Um, good day to, to everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks for this opportunity to, to speak to you about human factors and, and, and uh, its relationship with uh, maintenance management. Um, some of you who maybe know me may associate me with OKINF, with uh, the Global Maritime Forum or other organizations that I've worked with in the past. But, but today I'm here as a member giving you my my own perspective based on my many years uh, of experience in the in the industry. Um, to your question, Kyle, well, human factors as we know it refers to uh, the physical, psychological, and social characteristics that affect how humans interact with equipment and processes in a way that could lead to mistakes and accident. Now, within the shipping industry, there has been a significant reduction in overall number and severity of incidents over the last few, few decades. But in recent years, the improvement has plateaued. Accidents are still happening, and the industry is still causing harm to people or the environment. Some sources have it that um, about 80% of accidents are attributed to human behaviors or mistakes within the shipping industry. Now, that is a big number, and some might want to think that humans are to be blamed. But often, these mistakes are themselves the result of the way the workplace is set up, how we design work, and how we design equipment, and also importantly, how leaders influence the culture in an organization. Therefore, the shift we are seeing in the areas of human factors it's an acceptance that people will make mistakes. Um, therefore, the focus should be on addressing the systems and the conditions that lead to such mistakes. And that means making sure that work equipment and controls are well designed, making sure that procedures are clear and tax are well executed. Leaders making sure they set the right tone and respond the right way when things go wrong. The focus should be on what caused the incident or the accident as opposed to who. We should not blame the people that do the work. We should look to address the systems and the conditions that led to the incident. We should take the opportunity to learn. And also we should uh, make sure people are properly trained and equipped with the skills to deal with the changing or emerging situations that they may face 
when they interface with equipment and processes. So that's just my overview of human factors and, and how the industry is shifting uh, to focus on the systems and the conditions as opposed to the people uh, when something goes wrong. Oh, so if we talk specifically about maintenance, how do you think a maintenance system will ideally work from a human factors point of view? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, um, again, it's going back to that fundamental principle of uh, accepting and recognizing that humans interfacing with the maintenance management system will make mistakes. And therefore, we need to make sure we adopt a human-centered design philosophy uh, when uh, designing the maintenance system and the associated tasks. Uh, that means identifying the critical tasks that must be performed correctly, and if not done correctly, could lead to failure and consequently serious accident. Uh, we need to understand how human error could increase the chances of failure of that maintenance system, and therefore design the maintenance tasks and system to eliminate or min minimize human errors. Uh, and we also need to increase the ability to detect and recover uh, in the event of something going wrong. So, so yeah, these are some of the fundamental principles that are essential. Of course, maintenance management is key to the operation of ships, uh, the operation of various uh, uh, type of uh, equipment, uh, but it's important that a human-centered philosophy, uh, a human-centered design philosophy is adopted in terms of the task and the equipment itself. A lot of digital people might hear this and think you're talking about just the user interface, like what's on the screen, but you're talking about a lot more than this, like what's behind the stuff on the screen, aren't you? That's a... Indeed, indeed. It's, it's the whole system, actually. Uh, it's the whole system. The interaction with equipment, the interaction with procedures, the interaction with people. You need to understand how human factors, what the conditions and the setup is that could make people uh, make mistakes. Uh, if those conditions and setups are not right, they will drive the wrong behaviors and therefore you get accident. Uh, so when, when once accidents therefore happen, uh, the focus should be on addressing the systems and conditions, that, that the latent conditions within the system uh, and, and therefore preventing that from happening again as opposed to blaming people. Uh, the blame culture isn't the solution. Uh, if anything, it does worsen the situation. So the systems have to give the right information at the right time without too much of the wrong information so that's very hard to design isn't it yeah. correct it is to think about it's about looking at it uh, when, as you design the system uh the people the plant the, the tools you need to consider look at it from the human perspective you know the perspective of the people that will be using it whether on board the ship or ashore we need to take that into account uh when designing the the system because again you you need people to interface with that system, whether it's technology or, or otherwise, uh, and therefore making sure we reduce the likelihood for mistakes is fundamental to making sure the, uh, the operation is safe, is efficient, and of course, uh, it, we, we protect the environment. And the trend in shipping is more and more complicated equipment, isn't it? Particularly with the new systems to handle new types of fuel and ballast water systems and scrubbers. There's a lot of equipment which isn't which can't be maintained by the crew, or they need very specific instructions. So how, how do you think that that changes how maintenance needs to be managed? Do you think, or do you want to have any uh, any thoughts on how how maintenance management is changing and the demands on crew are changing because as the equipment is changing? Indeed, I mean, the, the, we all know today that uh, decarbonizing shipping is top on the agenda for, for, our, for our industry, uh, and therefore new fuels and complex technologies will be introduced in order to address pollution from ships and decarbonize the shipping industry. The industry is very much, decarbonization of shipping is very much underway and is going to happen. Uh, this will bring its own complexities, of course. We are beginning to see an increase in levels of automation and use of AI, uh, and of course, increase in digitalization, which are all good things uh, for, the, for the shipping industry and are essential to a safer, more secure, efficient and sustainable shipping. Therefore, there is a com compelling need to equip ships and shore base station with more advanced and proven technologies. Uh, that is why you know, I'm personally excited about the prospect of technologies being developed by companies like Smartship 
but to realize the full potentials, uh, it is vital that human factors issues are addressed adequately and that seafarers and users of any system uh, are fully trained on their use and how to manage any limitations uh, that are inherent. So it is great to see what smart, the companies like SmartShip are doing. Uh, again, it's just making sure the human factors aspect is incorporated in the design and use of the systems. Yeah, so sort of last question, the challenge for software companies, they have to develop tools which can tell people exactly what they need in a very useful way and uh, nothing more, far more than the sort of computer aids maintenance management system might say, do this work today, do this work tomorrow. We're looking for far more sophisticated systems that can tell people exactly what they need. Indeed, indeed. Exactly what they need in order to do the work they need to do safely, efficiently and in a compliant way you know, minimizing mistakes, recognizing that, you know, humans uh, will, will make mistakes uh, and therefore the systems have to be almost mis uh, 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 mistake proof, if you like. Um, but, I, but I think, again, that's where technology comes in to simplify it and make it user friendly. Yeah, systems are mistake proof. That's a huge yeah. <laughs> challenge from where we are now, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much, Sam. So Sam, Sam's agreed to stay online for a few more minutes. If anybody has a question to the Q&A box, if you can see, uh, see the Q&A box, there's one from uh, Marco Vatteroni at the bottom. So perhaps you can answer that if you press the, the typing answer button. But uh, now, um, thank you very much. And we'll go to uh, Pune in India. And we're going to hear from Joy Basu. So if Joy, if you'd like to turn the camera on. And uh, so we're going to explain how, how to do all this with a point of view of uh, getting the data off on board, which can help with maintenance and purchasing. So uh, over to you, Joy. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And thank you, Sam, for bringing out all the points about the human factors in safe shipping. Uh, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes, uh, especially in the areas of uh, maintenance and how digitalization is impacting that. And as a result of that, uh, how the procurement process is going through a shift. Please allow me to share my screen so all of you can see. I have a couple of slides, but uh, it's more important that I also share our experiences in this particular area. Okay. Right. So that's, that's the topic for today, but uh, it, it starts off with the most important aspect of uh, high quality data to be fetched from different machinery. So people can use LoRaWAN, they are using BLE, they're using straitjacket uh, uh, cables and bringing signals, Modbus, Profibus, Profinet, so on and so forth, depending upon different kind of makers and the protocols. And in some cases, like people would have experienced the Japanese makers would have their own proprietary protocols. So the, the aspect here is to be able to have a platform that can continue to fetch in data move from one vessel to the other at the same time data cleansing happens and is put it on the cloud or on shore for relevant analytics and intelligence so here is a quick snapshot of that what for one of the latest work that has been done may not be very relevant but nonetheless it's put over here because when we talk about data-driven intelligence that leads on to maintenance and procurement we are also looking at the quality of data that comes in and the number of data points and parameters. Now, this is where I want to bring you up to one particular screen over here. Uh, this might look a little overcrowded, but uh, this is very relevant wherein we are putting all the protocols and which helps us bring the data in, putting into a kind of a rule engine. And this rule engine becomes also a feeder for our machine learning and moving on to AI-based stuff. So we have a complete a uh, breakup of different use cases running into hundreds of lines of information that are put together. This is just a snapshot. If anybody would be interested, um, we, I, I would be able to actually showcase to them a complete Excel sheet, how this looks like. Maybe during the Q&A, we can do that bit. So this, this is one of the use cases of main engine turbocharger outlet exhaust gas temperature high what kind of failure advisory, what kind of connected alarms, what kind of correlations, what kind of thresholds, the past incidents that has happened, the failure mode that people get into it. And this when taken over months of data that has been collected and used together with the legacy data that we are getting, that's, that's exactly where 
we have a high frequency data together with the plant maintenance system data, together with incidents reports, uh, breakdown reports, breakdown maintenance reports, all of it put together. And that is exactly where we are seeing a lot of human factor also in the maintenance come in. Normally these are based on SOPs, which is great, but we also have to make our systems more intuitive, intelligent, and we need not wait for a situation to raise the alert and an alarm if we are able to do it way before. And here is a snapshot of that. So when we put in rule engine, when you put the machine learning algorithms on top of it, and you have on the right hand side that you see over here, different use cases. This is exactly where the industry is increasingly relying upon making its onboard crew more intelligent. It's not about replacing people, not about challenging their intelligence. It's about capturing the entire experience set of people. There are chief engineers, capable people, all of them this end up spending a couple of months on the vessel till they move on to the next. How do you get all those intelligence into your platform, thereby creating a very strong foundation on, on digital uh, digitally driven smart maintenance or data driven maintenance and moving on to the procurement side. So the best practices that is followed world over can be put together onto this. And this is where you configure the system, right? And that is where you bring in the agility. That is where you learn from similar vessel that one has experienced certain set of conditions whereby you put those conditions into your configurable screen. And that is where you can avert uh, probable downtime, possible downtime that you might be looking at, right? So this is one of the value adds that one may be looking at. Here we are looking at uh, uh, maybe a little small, but maybe some of you, you may want to use the zooms feature of in, uh, you know, zooming it up, enhancing on the top right. You can actually see it a little bigger. This, this is like a straight jacket example of how a plan maintenance system would allow or would require a person to put in these notes if they want to defer a maintenance, if they want to justify a maintenance regime, so on and so forth. The moment you do it with data driven, the high frequency data that comes in, actually this entire process is soon getting more redundant. You would require the machinery's condition to decide whether it requires immediate attention or not, or can it wait for a while? That's exactly what I was showing you, the rule-based engine, moving on to the ML part of it. And on top of it, people are actually, that's where we are working heavily on is like the advanced pattern recognition, APR. And that allows us to actually identify, diagnose, uh, uh, highlight, and here you see a, uh, an aspect of where we saw in the bearing, right? This wear and tear, once it's known, thanks to data, thanks to your algorithms, thanks to the past downtime that has happened and which is what was captured in the process. And that's exactly where data-driven intelligence is, is helping the owners and the ship technical managers to actually keep the vessel's health higher by at least 30 to 35 percent. That's a huge uptake for a technology to be able to bring in, which also means one in three incidences that can potentially create a downtime is known before. That's a great start. We have a lot of data. We have the legacy data. We have the plan maintenance. We have the running hours. We, we have the last breakdown report. We have the incidence reports and all of it put together. So it is just not configuring the thresholds that the maker has put because your vessel has gone through sufficient wear and tear over a period of time. So the algorithms put over here actually help you very easily to spot irregularities, potential flaws that you may actually see it. And, and, and you can actually go on to the root cause analysis of that. So the anomaly detection or eventually using the technology to come up with remaining usable life, right? Or some people may, come, may also call it time to failure. This is what is disrupting the existing maintenance process as well. And connected to that is they are making it the procurement process not dependent upon time and running hours, but purely by these data feeds and intelligence that comes in. And that is where technical advisory constantly keeps coming in. Technologies like using leveraging the holographic AR, VR, 
that's exactly where we realized when we launched it a couple of months back, allows the shore team, I mean, to go inside the specific equipment, see it for themselves what is happening. I, I do have a video, maybe at the end of the presentation, I can play it up for you a couple of seconds, but that is like you being there inside, experiencing it in conjunction with hundreds and thousands of other feeds and information and your personal experience, everything coming up. And that's where technology is leveraging maintenance regime. That is where even with digital platforms, when we bring the uptime to an extent of 30, 35% higher, technologies like AR, VR can eventually push it even more. So we are yet to test it out, but this is something that is already running with extreme positive results. And this also allows you to have the kind of insights like never before, which means you don't use these technologies in the platforms only for training purposes. No, you build in your high frequency data, marry it together with your AR, VR, and that's, that's where you have a complete new perspective. You may call it metaverse, you may call it whatever environment, but the beauty is you have the information that you've always wanted. And that's exactly where uh, an experienced set of more than 52 vessels that we have built up uh, in, in some of the selected use cases gives us a strength to keep continue to bring on, on board. Here is an outcome. We saw how the data is being fetched. We saw how it is being, being processed. Now, after having done that, we have done the quality management of the data. And finally, the algorithms run and it gives you the health score. Just imagine, so far we were used to knowing health scores of some of the regulatory bodies or some, some organizations like Rightship for the bulkers. But here, irrespective of the kind of or the vessel that you have make model type, year, old, new, uh, doesn't matter. You will be able to actually have the health score for all the parameters that you would intend to bring in. And that's directly shows on quantifying what is it that your vessel's current situation is in. Here is another snapshot. These are all happening automated. Nobody is sitting and typing, but it is still important that an experienced chief engineer or, 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 or uh, uh, someone with at least 20 plus years of experience is able to go through, validate, revalidate these, these aspects. So the digital platform does produce reports and these reports are giving you traffic signals. So the main engine and tail shaft seems to have problem. And this is where there is a diagnosis. And along with the diagnosis, there's a recommended action. And what is it that we are doing is even before your DG is supposed to go down, we actually know it uh, maybe 30 days before that, maybe 20 days before that. And that's exactly where the procurement cycle also kicks in. So components that we are seeing regularly that can benefit from it is, is, is like the, the compressors, the motors, the vibration, the pumps, the valves, yeah? the fuel injectors, all of this actually can get directly linked to the data feeds that keeps coming in. And finally, all the data that comes on board, you have a, a com complete standardization process of 19847, 19848. This, this particular diagram, I've taken it from another organization, but where we are associated with, but uh, the, the, the reason for showing is how 19848 and 47 is being used so that you can standardize data across your vessels, irrespective of mate model type, right? And finally, the information now we have is high quality data feed, high frequency data, together with your process and legacy data, together with the insights and inputs that you have. And it gives you the intelligence in terms of the next cycle of maintenance or predictive maintenance or actually actionables leading on to procurement process, which is where the entire chain of from data telemetry to an action being taken by the procurement team can be put together like this. And, and this is where digitally smart procurement processes working out. Organizations like worldwide, you would know a lot of ship supplies and use like ship serve and all. So 
just an, for example, they would integrate the high frequency data coming, the condition monitoring of a specific equipment and basis that whatever advisory that has come in, you know, in the next spot, X, Y, Z part is already awaiting over there. You don't have to keep adding on your expenses on, on the fixed cost of the spares or the parts. At the same time, you have made your operations pretty more agile. And this is where I come down to the end of my presentation where we just put together a kind of a schematic so that you understand one of the use cases of about 4,000 parameters on an average from um, maybe a four years old vessel, maybe the new one, the, the new other vessel higher the number of parameters and it is helping us standardizing data all across the vessels, making superintendents for all vessel actually to benefit from each other. The instances and breakdown scenarios are shared with others. People learn from each other. And with the help of advanced pattern recognition, we are seeing it takes about one to two quarters before people are benefiting directly from it. And moving from running hours and plan maintenance to need-based, condition-based. And that is where the just-in-time concept also kicks in. And this is eventually helping in the entire process of the pool processes across the fleet. So you can plug in, you can bring in re procurement plan for multiple vessels instead of one single superintendent planning for only his set of vessels. And this is where economies of scale kicks in. This is where organizations save money. This is where you order for larger set of vessels and you also plan in, in ahead of time. So thank you uh, for hearing me out. We'll be open for any questions. I also have some of my colleagues, if I need any help to answer, probably we'll be able to do that. Thank you well, everyone once again. Well, thank you very much, Joy. So we're now going to the Q&A part of the webinar. So if anybody has any questions to put in, I mean, so I, I, I'm thinking, so connecting this to what, um, Sam was saying how we can um, ensure seafarers don't make mistakes. That's the sort of main main role of a plan maintenance system, telling them what they need to know. But I guess there's still quite a gap between his vision and and sort of what, what you're presenting. But I guess we're getting closer in filling the gap, isn't it? I mean, how how can you stop people making maintenance mistakes? I guess that's by having a really good model in the spreadsheet of all the things that may go wrong and and warning them at the right time. Is it? Do you think? Sure. So if you want me to address it, I can just quote some of the recent examples that we've had. I think that's, well, I mean, stopping people making mistakes, I think that's a... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, we've, we've had this technical advisory being published for quite some time, but it, superintendents, technical superintendents were just not used to looking into data-driven intelligence. They would rather depend upon what they are seeing and feeling, right? So we do not... Uh, negate that. That's very important part. So what they are seeing and feeling once it is fed and reconfirmed with the data and in terms of intelligence, and that is where we could avert a lot of downtime. One such case being the same organization which ignored three warnings and had when the vessel reached Singapore and, and also the three, the two DGs were not working, the cranes didn't work. And, and, and that is where the, the senior management downwards, this realization comes in that let's give data the due respect in this process. And we have had, we have had issues with makers like main engine maker. There was a downtime, there was a major issue, but the main engine maker would at times would say, no, this was not because of that, because of some regime and lack of discipline amongst the crew. Now to identify and diagnose those issues are so easy these days. You can have situational awareness data being brought in. You also are able to tell what the human being at that point was doing. All kinds of exchanges and interactions are being brought in, in in absolute clarity. And that is where we are seeing the increasingly crew and shore-based superintendents and technicians, depending upon what the data shows. And as a result, even when they don't want, they are at times forced to actually look into this whole process and thereby the discipline of uh, getting on to the predictive maintenance part keeps coming on more pronounced. Yeah, it's an aided tool, yes. Yeah, I mean, I suppose people who fix engines are not used to working with data. I mean, maybe in the aircraft sector, everybody uses data all the time and that's how they're used to working, but it's kind of kind of culture change, I suppose, or way changing the way of working the shipping needs to go through perhaps. 
they do work with data call quite a bit but the crew was not used to working with data so much they were depending upon the shore offices sending them intelligence but just imagine that the shore and the uh, onboard crew having the same set of intelligence which is where the alarm points are put in everybody knows at what specific level what kind of escalations i'm going to take care of right and and that is where we have many 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 such instances where you know the temperature trend under a, a piston of a scavenged space of a particular unit continuously being seen by the system and that is where on the inspection we say go and inspect because that's what we feel and which is what would show like a broken piston wing now this until and unless there was a breakdown nobody would care to look into it but but now the system is driving so the 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 trust factors is slowly coming on and people start seeing that this is to help my job and not to uh, you know cause any kind of uh, um, interference in that and that is where we are seeing it's a collaborated stuff having pretty good for all the customers that we work with that's exactly what they value more in fact one of the customers has a mandate of zero breakdown maintenance in next one year we don't know if we can achieve that but but it's a, it's a tall vision tall goal to have but uh, we are all working in that direction. Yeah. On the subject of AI, so I think this is very misunderstood in the shipping industry because a lot of people have read amazing things about AI and assume you can just switch on an AI that will tell people the right thing at the right time, like some chat box. And I think the reality is very different. But so to do uh, maintenance management needs a lot of very careful systems and thought through, like you showed with your, your spreadsheet. I mean, there's some role for AI in there, I think you mentioned, but it's got to be but in the right way. Do you, do you want to share thoughts on how AI can best be used in this kind of, to help with sure. maintenance? Sure. I mean, uh, I, I think technically we are yet to see any kind of AI working. So that's why I stopped at machine learning, which, is, which means all the experiences that we are having and all the kind of downtime scenarios, all the wear and tear that we are identifying, each one of those are being fed back as an experience into the machinery so that they know the rules that you have put for the machine to work and for data to give intelligence keeps on getting enriched, right? And that is one simplest way of bringing it up. I can give you some statistics. A lot of high frequency data companies, uh, both in oil and gas and industrial and maritime, the number of alerts and alarms that come in ranges between 20%, 22% to 35%, which is because of the sense of fault, right? So how do you do your AI or ML based on a sense of fault, which is giving you faulty data, which means data quality management comes way before. That's number one. A more than 43% to 50% of data still remains to be explored and used, which means, and it's same with us as well in, in SmartShip. We might get 3000 data parameters, but we are yet to use a whole lot of it to increase the kind of intelligence, which is what the entire uh, endeavor for all of us is on to. So uh, in nutshell, the best way for an organization to quickly, there is an easier way, big impact and a tougher, expensive way, low impact. We always go for the easier, smaller, cheaper with high impact, which is reducing the breakdown maintenance. And that is where all the experiences, including the past experiences has to be fed into the system. It requires a lot of work. And, and it, it took us six months to convince a customer actually to have all their incidences being put in. And, and that is where we are now slowly enhancing this entire process of bringing corporate wise intelligence and not only for the vessel, not only for the superintendent. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of work, but then if, if, if a result of this six months of work, you can reduce breakdowns, it's pretty worth doing, isn't it? So that's the kind of absolutely. Thing. So that is where it moves to one to two quarters and your breakdown maintenance come down. I saw a question. I can quickly address that if that's okay. Oh, or I can write. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, it's smart ship a standalone platform or can it be integrated with other PMS software? That's from Ram Krishnan Velour. Yes, it can be integrated to plan maintenance and that's the beauty of it. All the running hours and all kind of running condition that a human being has fed in, you can actually have your high frequency data go into your plan maintenance. And that is where your plan maintenance becomes smarter. Well, no, yes. Ram, Ram Krishnan is from BS Ship Management. So, so, yeah, so. Yes. Um, how do you integrate it together with other plan maintenance software? Is there a, the, these are standard API integrations, but but it is just not the integration to give data. 
once I give you an intelligent data set from last eight months or nine months, which included, for example, one dry dock and uh, nine plant maintenances every month happen and change of three time parts, that intelligence, once it flows into the PMS, the amount of intelligence and reporting capability that one would have is so different from a human fed information that was being fed into that process, right? So it is uh, API integration together with a whole lot of algorithms that needs to be playing together. And that's integrating sensor data, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. Oh, I mean, there's, I mean, it's also the models you're making with the sensor data, but it's far harder to integrate those, isn't it? But uh, yeah, that is correct. And you also must be intelligent enough to choose what kind of data must flow into plan maintenance, and not every data that is fed or 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 the telemetry process is giving you give all of it, right? You will you will choose your data sets. Can I ask you about this ISO standard? So we did an event in Nor Shipping two weeks ago, and this came up as a big issue of how standard ways of getting data from sensors, because people say a lot of sensor companies are still only sharing data in proprietary formats. I didn't even know a standard existed, to be honest with you. But do you want to explain a bit more about, I mean, can everyone use this standard, but at the moment, not many people are using it? Is that what? Yeah, I happen? mean, um, yeah, of, of course. The data standards 19847 and 19848, uh, one is to procure data from different machinery, and the other is to standardize that data that has come from different machinery onto a commonly readable format, right? So the same fleet would have vessel made in Korea with Samsung, Hyundai, and the other vessel made in Japan with BMAC, Furuno, and the third vessel made maybe in China with Sire, Nico, and other make model WinGD engines. Now, each of these makers would have their own convention, own notations, everything on their own. And how does it make it easy for even a software or a system that you put in place to actually learn from each other and thereby know if a similar set of circumstances that the vessel went through. And imagine all these vessels, they make their trip from Rijau, north of China to Brazil. There may be wood chip carriers, there may be tankers, there may be palm oil, there may be gas carriers. I'm just giving a random example based on our experience. And this is where it was important that we start standardizing it. I mean, it's, 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 it's not that interesting to talk about it, 19847 and 19848, but the process once it is undertaken and the data feeds that comes in makes the organization and technology system so robust that irrespective of the vessel that the company has decided to sell and a new one that they have onboarded, your information set and the intelligence that you create for next decade is completely intact. And every amount of situation circumstances that one vessel has gone through can easily flow into as an experience into rest of the vessels. And that is, we are talking about close to 20% of the time saved for a superintendent and often up to 11 to 15% of dollar value saving that can bring in, in your maintenance and procurement process purely by standardizing data and making it into a singular platform and, and that is where your single source of truth starts coming in. Oh, well, that's very good. We've got a question from Jessel Menta, who I think is uh, working in a uh, ship management software in uh, Kuala Lumpur. He's asking, is a smart ship offered as a service? And uh, another question, is the data collected on the cloud? Um, he's asking, oh, in the three questions, yes. do you uh, use the data yes. to trend and benchmark prediction? With that, so bringing data together from multiple companies, sure. or do you uh, segregate it by clients? So she's from uh, sure. Williamson. Uh, uh, yes, sure. from. Thanks, Jessel, uh, for putting this up. Um, yes, this is uh, put on the cloud. This is a SaaS service, which means customers can just pick and choose what they want. And finally, the experiences of one customer being given to others can only happen when there is a data sharing agreement that they have come on board. It is happening in Ship DC in Japan. It's happening in Korea Consortium. But for us, it is at 
we keep enhancing the platform with all the experiences we have from different vessel and it becomes a feature. But eventually it is moving on to a shared economy where one customer will benefit from the other customer and it will be a collaborated way forward. Yes, that's where the, the industry is headed towards. Small consortiums do exist to do that. We are part of those uh, consortiums ourselves and hence we are seeing the benefit in that process. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Carl, it seems like you are on mute. Excuse me, Chess Al is a plan maintenance system manager with Williamson Group in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you about the augmented reality. So, how how does this help? I mean, if you need the right information at the right time, you can get it on a screen. You can get it on a headset. I mean, having it on a screen is a lot simpler. So, do, do you want to explain what's the added benefit of having the augmented sure. reality? Do you think? Sure. Uh, actually, I, I I can I can very quickly very very quickly show it to you and and this is right now when you have either the headsets then you can actually have the 3d feel to it but when you do not have a headset this is like a glass and that glass is like one of your minority report movie you can touch it you can feel it you can move it around everything and you can be in that particular position so what you are seeing, right? So, so what you are seeing is actually high frequency data together with the AR we are being brought in. And there is uh, all kind of alerts, alarms that has been put together. And there is a visual impact into the whole thing that is happening, right? So the amount of awareness that a shore-based superintendents of fleet managers and the crew, or now it is also being used by the technicians. So when the technician wants to remotely log in and actually go through and try and diagnose, while our platform Smartship was allowing all this while to make it remote, but now with this AR, VR, the experience and the correctness of having it done on the first instance itself is uh, way better than before. That's amazing. So, so perhaps as the last question, coming on to the human factors thing. So, I was at a uh, conference in London, and the safety manager of a London shipping company said that when people say people make mistakes, what they it should be that people are not in a position where they're capable of making mistakes. And then this uh, this safety manager said he didn't understand AI because he's not he's not a technologist. But he said, I think I'd like to see an AI that will work out when somebody is about to make a mistake and uh, warn them about it or stop them from making the mistake. So I was sitting there in the audience thinking about digital technology. I don't think digital technology is anywhere near being able to do such a thing because it doesn't have all the data needed in a digital format that the AI would need. But uh, since we touched on this subject, I don't know if you want to, I mean, can you imagine an AI that would be able to tell people when people are about to make a mistake or could warn their managers that a mistake is about to be made by somehow analyzing what they're doing, or do you think this is sort of 20 years into the future, if, if any? Is that... um, I, I may not be able to address it to that extent, but I know of two companies. One of them is having those wearable device, which the person is made to wear, either as a helmet or, or as a um, pulse oximeter kind of thing. And they are constantly checking this person's uh, behavioral patterns and sweat levels and eyelid movement and, you know, there, there are about seven, eight, nine indications they are looking into that person. So how do, it's like a facial recognition when you're walking into LA airport, um, how do they know if this person is going to be of a potential uh, problem or not? So there are a lot of expressions that are getting analyzed. I haven't seen that yet, and I don't foresee how an AI will tell that a human being is about to make a mistake until and unless we put an interface device, which means at all point of time, I'm being monitored, which is what we don't know how that is going to happen, right? If, if someone is monitoring me, that particular device will be collecting a whole lot of data points to actually see my past behavior on a certain situation, if it is being replayed in this situation and my sequence of activities and, and all of those will become relevant. So honestly, it's a very interesting subject, but um, I may not be the right person actually to comment on that. 
Wow, we've got another question come in from uh, Theodore Ayanu. It's uh, quite a long one. He's asking uh, software and AI to the, all these is one factor. Another one is the hardware needed to collect data. Telemetry and hardware sensor aspects of digitalization is too expensive for an owner. How do you see this area progressing in terms of sensors? What happens if we get just a lot of software and diagnostics, but nobody can work with these because of the high cost of hardware? And my colleague has just told me that Theodore is also with BS Ship Management. Yes. Um, so is this a real obstacle, the high cost yes. of hardware? Yes. So thank you for bringing that up. I can tell you from our personal experiences that when we started working in this, we knew the organizations working on uh, data telemetry, data collection, which could run into 150 to $200,000 end-to-end project cost, down to about $10,000 today. And it is headed on to be about $1,000 process. This is what innovation is doing. This is what engineering is all about. This is where we have seen that happening in manufacturing. And I can guarantee you uh, that in one or two quarters, we'll come back to you with such a device, which will be able to do it at almost negligible cost, which means this cost will go out of considerations for most vessels. I was just saying, so Theodore is the... uh... Group Technical Superintendent at Bernard Shorter Ship Management in Greece. Um, I mean, what, what kind of hardware we're talking about condition monitoring here, aren't we? And, and fuel sensors, this is not. No, no, no. So, so, so the hardware, it's not going to do condition monitoring. This particular hardware is going to specialize only in onboard data collection. And once you have collected your data and you bring it on to your gateway, and you would have all kind of edge applications, edge software, edge devices over there. Right. So even now, this is a segregated thing. So there are two ways it's progressing. One is all these algorithms, intelligence being burnt into a chip, and this chip will be there as a small set in the vessel itself. So a whole lot of intelligence you see. It. So you don't send data to the cloud. Why would you need to send that? Do the airlines send all the data to the ground control center and then depend upon them? No. The pilot sitting over there need to have that intuitive behavior pattern to take a decision. That's exactly where it will happen in maritime as well. You cannot make the shore people smarter while depriving the crew of the intelligence. So that is where the industry is headed towards, which also means the cost of collecting data on board from flow meters, from your alarm monitoring system, from bridge navigation system, from your auxiliaries, from your DG, from your boiler, all of it are from your you know, uh, cargo console cranes, this cost is going to come down drastically. And that is where the hardware part of the entire thing will become insignificant. I don't know, will it be one year, two year, three years, but it is going to happen because it has happened everywhere else. Well, can you give some specific examples of hardware? I, mean, I thought this is all sensors, it's not, yeah, I mean, what, what kind so, of- so, Yeah. So a flow meter, which is a mechanical flow meter moving on to a digital flow meter or a Coriolis flow meter cannot be avoided. That will still be there. But having done that upgrade, would you like to spend another $15,000 on the vessel to get that data onto your cloud? That $15,000 will not exist. Another example is from your main engine data, main engine LOP or your power management system or your vibrations and all, you would have already spent money on, your, on a vibration sensor. Having spent that, would you like to spend another $5,000 to bring that data onto the cloud, you see? So the sensors like vibration sensors, the digital flow meters, your spatial arrangement maybe uh, in the liner, that expense will still be there till the makers are able to bring down the cost. But once that is there, all the data from different machinery brought onto gateway and then to cloud, that will become negligible. Which started with $150,000 down to $50,000, down to 20, down to 11, you know, that's, that's, that's the trajectory. And historically it's been proven, even oh. in maritime. So just, uh, just having a digital flow meter is very expensive, but that's a very useful sensor for the fuel consumption and the engine health perhaps yes. also. And a... Yes, mm. those critical sensors will stay because that is where you would need a trusted sensing equipment to bring the right high quality data. After that, data from different parts of the ships 
to be brought together. The flow meter could be from Aqua Metro, your main engine MAN BW, your DG from Caterpillar, your bridge navigation from JRC Furuno, different maker, different parameters, different sets of protocols. And finally, bringing them onto the gateway is the experience a lot of people like us bring in, right? And that particular experience will become a commodity. That will no more be the experience that people would like to pay for going forward. Yeah, very good. Okay, so perhaps to sort of sum up then, so uh, what we're seeing in the future, we're going to see like a few more sensors, but a lot more working with the data and a lot more careful thinking about how to present the data so it gives people exactly what they need and helps them avoid making mistakes. I don't know if you have any any last thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with before we finish. No, I'm, I'm glad that uh, between last two years, what we have seen is the velocity at which the adoption is happening on this particular front where people are using high frequency data, especially for different use cases, maintenance, breakdown maintenances and procurement being uh, top, top of the food chain, I would say. Doing fuel performance, doing hull performance is what we started with uh, two years back. But now when people use this data to leverage uh, uh, absolutely fundamental problem of how the main engine is running, that is where the maturity of adoption is also being shown and demonstrated. And we are glad that we are experiencing it ourselves with all the customers that we work with. Oh, yeah. that's good, good. Well, well, thank you very much. And I think we can finish there. I shall uh, pass back to Farah for the closing words. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Once again, I right. appreciate it. Thank you. To so our guest speakers, Joy Basu and Sam Megwa, and to all our viewers, we'll be sending you a YouTube video link soon with contact details if you have any more questions. Join us for our next webinar this Thursday on the 22nd of June with Opsilog, which we can book online at our website. Bye. Bye bye. Oh. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Carl, and all the audience. Thank you for being there. Appreciate.